Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hey, everyone. I am Jill Griffin, and welcome to The Career Refresh. This week, I have an award-winning author to introduce you to, Rob Volpe. Rob and I first met back in New York City in our early days around strategy and marketing and branding, and he has always struck me as such an astute observer of life, and he's a master storyteller, but he does it through the lens of empathy and compassion. He is the CEO of Ignite360, a strategy and insights firm where he leads a team of insights, strategy, and creative professionals that serve the world's leaning brands across a range of industries. Brands and companies like Facebook, Pepsi, Alter Beauty, Hershey's, Whole Foods, Microsoft, Warner Brothers, just to name a few people. (laughs) Really, really impressive work. He is the author of the award-winning book, Tell Me More About That, Solving the Empathy Crisis One Conversation at a Time. He's been a thought leader in the role of empathy in marketing and in the workplace, and he's a contributor to the Entrepreneurs Leadership Network, frequently speaking about topics at conferences, corporation, colleges, and on podcasts, and of course, the media. He's a graduate of Syracuse University, SI Newhouse School of Public Communication, and he lives in San Francisco with his husband and three darling cats. His book, Tell Me More About That, is the silver award winner at the IBPA Benjamin Franklin Awards for Best Self-Help Book of 2022. In this episode, we dig in to defining the five steps to empathy. We also talk about the misconceptions about empathy and things that we really need to debunk. We talk about how empathy can be used to persuade other people and whether it's colleagues or clients or a job interview, how empathy when used well is a beautiful tool. And also how does empathy at the workplace How are you using it to pivot and refresh and rethink aspects of your career? So as always, I want you to dig in. And Rob and I talked about that, you know, as you bring us questions and send us questions, we'll do a follow-up and answer. So if any questions on empathy, definitely email me at hello at jillgriffincoaching.com. I'll put that in the show notes also, but email us any of your questions and we will do a follow-up episode. Rob has generously offered to do that, to answer your questions. I'm going to put all of his information in the show notes where you can learn more about his book and get it. Uh, You may also want to be giving this to your employees, people. You may want to buy a stack of them and hand them out to the leaders of your company. What a beautiful way to set yourself up for the second half of the year in really finding ways to infuse empathy into your company. I'll also put his information, have how to work with him through uh, his work at Ignite360. So as always, dig in. I want to hear from you. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. And as always, here's to possibility. Hey, Rob, I'm so happy that you are here with me today. Jill, oh my gosh, it's so awesome to see you and to be here. Thank you for having me. Ah, let's get right into it. So you have written this book that so many of us, whether we realize it or not, need around empathy. And the book, Tell Me More About That. And I know you just recently received an award, a silver award winner at the IVPA Benjamin Franklin Awards for the best self-help book of 2022. That yes. is huge. huge. Thank you. Oh my God. It was crazy. Like I did, I mean, it, first book, First time author, beyond wildest dreams that the industry, publishing industry would go, this is a really good book and worthy of an award. And I was told that that was like self-help was like one of the most crowded categories. So 
uh, it just reaffirming, you know, of all the things that I set out to do. And I mean, even as we were talking pre-show, I, 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 the book is kind of like Russian nesting dolls where, you know, yes, it's about empathy and how to, to activate more empathy, but there's some really funny, engaging, entertaining stories. And it's set in the world of consumer insights. So I'm going into people's homes, strangers, and what's that experience like? And then there's the memoir side of it as well. I'm really vulnerable about who I am and my own failures around empathy and successes. And so to have the industry, the publishing industry, recognize that it worked on all of those levels is just uh, like, wow. I, yeah, I, I, it's so beautiful. I, I, and just also as, as someone who read the book um, well before I knew that you and I were going to be talking and having known you from many years ago, like I loved that I could hear you in the book. Like it is so authentic to your voice. I could hear you. I was like, I could hear almost like where you started to laugh when you were talking. <laughs> it's so funny. And again, for anyone, um, you know, I'm going to put all of the information in the show notes that you can get a copy of the book, but, you know, understanding like one of the pieces about moldy pancakes fortified with homegrown penicillin was one of my favorite lines <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to let you read it yourself, dear listeners, to yes. read more about that. Absolutely. And if, if uh, for those that are audio book fans, I narrated the audio book. So you literally can hear me tell sure, yeah. stories. Which is the that... best. I love when the author does that. Yeah. So take us back. I want to get into the book, but I also want to go back, which is what I asked all of my guests and that is, you know, so many people think that a career path is linear. Like you start somewhere, you go through school, you go through some sort of vocational training, you get a job and that's it. And that has not been my experience or frankly, anyone I know's experience. So when we go way back, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? I mean, I, oh my gosh, if you go back to me as a child in the 70s growing up, I wanted to be one of the Charlie's Angels. Um, <laughs> but then the first real like job that I was like, oh, this is what I want to do as a career. I wanted to be an airline pilot, commercial airline pilot. Nice. I love, I've, I've always been fascinated with commercial aviation, that idea of going someplace and traveling and um, I just thought like, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to fly the planes and, and take people around. And, and my dad told me, took me, pulled me aside and he's like, son, there's a lot of math involved with, uh, aviation. And I was like, math, good Lord. No, get like <laughs> run the other direction. Um, and then I wanted to be a journalist after that. I was really inspired by, uh, Linda Ellerby who people will know either from NBC News or from Nick News in particular. And some people might have grown up with her um, on Nick News. And she wrote this amazing uh, autobiography called And So It Goes. And I was just so captivated and inspired. And she had great use of turn of phrase and language. Uh, loved it. And I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. So that was kind of the next big career path for me. Right. And, you know, you went to Syracuse University, which is known for being one of the top media and communication schools. So kind of take us through from there into being a researcher and the insights work that you do. Yeah, I think um, went to Syracuse, went to the Newhouse School, was got into the broadcast journalism program, started down that path. And then, you know, and there are just all these little detours and, and things that happen in your life that take you on these alternate paths. And I, I write about it in the book um, in one of the chapters called Altering Perceptions, where um, I, I recount being at Syracuse when 9-11, uh, um, when the Panama 103 bombing happened. Oh. And I was the station manager of the campus radio station, WJPZ. And I remember the go through that whole event, but I had been interested in the idea of studying abroad over in London and the loss of the the students and that whole experience. I was just like, you know, and, and encouraged by my dad that I needed to just go for it and, you know, go after the London thing. Well, going to London meant I had to give up the broadcast journalism because I couldn't do both. And so I kind of rationalized for myself that, that experience is going to be bigger for me. And, and, you know, I can do television, radio, film, I can stay in Newhouse. And so I did that. And then I got interested in working in Hollywood uh, when I graduated. So I moved, packed up, moved to LA, 
worked uh, in in business affairs and legal affairs at Fox Broadcasting, and I I fell into those jobs because I could type and I was good on the phone. Like summer jobs and typing class in high school paid dividends for me later on. Yeah, I mean, seriously, we sat through typing classes. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. And then that is exactly, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what your degree was. That's where you were starting. You were needed to 120 be words a minute, no errors. And <laughs> I like, they wanted me. Um, so yeah, so, and, and a lot of it, I always approached of just to me, I'm very much a kinetic learner, a practical learner, like get your foot in the door, figure it out. If there's more education that you need, you can go get that, but start to learn by doing. And so got into Hollywood. Um, it was intellectually stimulating, but I wasn't super passionate about the business affairs side of it. But at the same time, I was finding what I was really interested in was what I thought of as marketing at the time and advertising and studio trailers and analyzing how they were, what the story was they were trying to do. It was about influencing human behavior and trying to convince somebody to buy. Hmm. So I decided I wanted to get into marketing. And so packed my things up. Uh, people in Hollywood were saying, leave Hollywood, go get experience someplace else in like a different category because they were like, you can you you can come back into Hollywood, but you can't really grow up in Hollywood and then leave because it gets so specialized in the more and more that you do. And I'm sure there, you know, that was back in the nineties. So I think things have changed somewhat, but I was like, okay, I'm going to leave Hollywood and then I can always come back. And I never did. Um, <laughs> I moved, moved to New York, got into PR. Cause again, it was like, what's, what can I do? What, what, what practical opportunities were there? I got a job at a PR firm, started doing PR, but also at the time, Starbucks was one of our clients and they were launching a line of ice cream. So this is back in 95, 96. And Starbucks didn't do any advertising. They did all grassroots and PR related things. So they wanted to do sampling events around the country. And I raised my hand and said, yeah, I can I can figure out how to scoop ice cream and and do the things. Started traveling around the country doing that. And that was really my first time getting experience talking to consumers because we'd hand them a sample of the ice cream and they, you know, immediately eat it. We were at the, you know, outdoor jazz festival or a fireworks event or whatever. So people were eating the the product and giving us feedback on it. And I was fascinated by the response that people were having and why mm. they were feeling the way they were. And I'd write up in my report, it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, we you know, handed out 20,000 samples. We handed out 20,000 samples. And this is what people had to say right. about it. Real information, which a brand dies for getting Exactly, out. exactly. And the clients loved it. Um, and they even said, oh, this is like, you know, getting field research done at the same time. Um, so I, I had different touch points with insights throughout my career, starting at that moment in the mid nineties, but, you know, I, I wasn't paying attention to the signs the universe was putting in front of me, or it wasn't really clear, like, how do I turn this into an actual career itself? Um, later, about five, six years later, I was working at Kraft Foods up in Terrytown, and the, um, insights team, I was doing consumer promotions. So we were doing coupons and promotional activity, but the insights team recognized like, oh, he's, he's really interested. Cause I'd be the one that would go to the focus group, stay through right. the entire day of focus groups for the debrief, all the things they had an opportunity. They were doing some in homes with uh, women from the Caribbean of Caribbean origin who were making soluble coffee. And it was for like Maxwell House instant coffee. And they wanted to see how they could tap into that. And, you know, nobody in the marketing team was signing up to go on those. Right. And I'm like, I'll and go, I'll go. Cross athlete going, I can do that. <laughs> totally, totally. So uh, I convinced my boss to let me go. I sat in on two of the in-homes. I do not speak any Spanish. Um, the interviews were conducted in Spanish but I understood everything. I was just the body language and, you know, some of the things that the moderator would mention and just, I loved it. I soaked all of that up, but again, didn't understand how I could do that for a living. Flash forward a few more years later, get laid off from a job. And like the universe will continue to put the same roadblock in front of you until you figure out how to clear it. Mm -hmm. And that's what was happening with me. And finally, um, the owner of a, a research firm I'd been doing some consulting with 
She was like, I'm looking for somebody just like you that has the strategic thinking, can write a good PowerPoint, but that also knows how to moderate. And we played the name game. I was like, oh, who do I know that could fit that <laughs> bill? Hmm, who do I know? <laughs> Seriously, Jill, three days later, three days later, I'm at a oh, swimming pool <laughs> doing the backstroke and looking up at the sun going, wait a minute, I like talking to people. Maybe I'd be good at this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But and that's so, a really good insight for our listeners that, but you've said a couple of things here, right? Is one, the universe keeps giving you signals that there might be something else or a different place for you to be investigating. And yeah. two, sometimes it does take looking in the mirror saying, you know what? I'm going to throw my name in the ring. I am qualified for this. Yes. So I love those two takeaways. It's great. And thank you. And following up on it, the woman who initially is the owner of the firm who said that to me when I like was like, oh my God, maybe it's me. I, I called two people. I called a friend who had her own insights consulting practice. And she was like, oh my God, you'd be great. Here's where you need to go to get trained and let me know when you've done it. And maybe I can put you to work. And then I called the person who had originally said, I'm looking to hire somebody. And her response was, oh, I wasn't even thinking it could be you. And oh. <laughs> So who did I end up I'm here. With? Hello. <laughs> so I went ahead and I got trained and I called my friend up. And a month after I got trained, I was standing in a Walmart in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the frozen vegetable aisle, waiting patiently to see if anyone would interact with a test product from Green Giant. And I was hooked. Amazing. All right. So I love that level of detail because, again, it helps people see that our journeys are rarely linear. So take us to now. I mean, what prompted you to write the book? Tell me more about that. So I had, uh, em empathy has been my superpower since I was a kid. And I write about it in the book, growing up in Indiana and getting bullied and teased. And empathy was my survival skill. And then as an adult, it just became part of who I was and how I would move through the world and use that in business negotiations or management or my day-to-day -day life. And then there was a study that came out of the University of Michigan that found there was a 40% decline in college and empathy among college students over a 20 year period of time. That was really alarming. We started at my firm, Ignite360, doing more coaching and training for people because clients, marketers were wanting to go get some empathy, as I would say. They wanted to like go connect with who their consumer was. And yet we would go do those experiences and put those together. And they were not understanding, like, you know, they would sit in judgment of the person that they had just met. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you're just and like, okay. Human, people are human or messy. That's what we do. We judge. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so we started to get curious, like, what's getting in people's way? How can we help them overcome that? Develop the five steps. The sort of key moment, though, for me, I was um, guest lecturing at a university here in San Francisco to a marketing class. I talk about the insights industry, and then I always take the opportunity to talk about empathy because anytime I can help raise some awareness, and I do that by sharing my stories, some of which are in the book. Mm -hmm. And the students were all just slack jawed, like paying attention. They weren't on their phones, they weren't on their laptops, they were listening. And a little voice inside my head said, These are the stories that you need to tell. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, this is what I, I, I'd been thinking about writing a book, wasn't sure what it was going to be. And that was the moment, the voice, my intuition just told me, this is what you need yeah. to do. Yeah. And, and I started writing. So what I love about that, and, and again, to our listeners, as you read the book, you'll see, I mean, in the title, right? Tell me more about that, solving the empathy crisis, one conversation at a time. One of the things that's so beautiful about how Rob has approached this is, yeah, he could just list out for you. Here are the five or the 10 things you need to do. Do this, not that, blah, blah, blah. Here's some case studies. Here's some data, right? But that would be the antithesis <laughs> of empathy, right? Yeah. So what is so beautiful is you're really in taking on this journey where you're going in and you're going story after story. And if you work under, I'll say, the umbrella of marketing, there's going to be a lot of familiarity to it. If you don't work in the umbrella of marketing, you still know these people. You know, you like, we all know someone who, who are like these stories, which I think is what's so beautiful about the book. So thank you for bringing that out in, in your work. 
Thank you. I, it was important to me to write a book that people would want to read as I was kind of talking about the nesting dolls, but it's really that, you know, I wanted people to be entertained and informed. Um, but the way that you help people learn is through storytelling. And, and I've, I've had readers come up to me and just be like, oh my God, I'm almost at the end of the book and I'm upset because I don't want it to stop or, you know, how much they're enjoying reading it. And, and, I think that's a beautiful thing because ultimately it's understanding and connecting to our shared human experience. And that's what empathy is all about. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go deeper on that. You know, um, first, maybe if you would define empathy, because there's a lot of different understandings of what it is. And then I'd love you to go into some misconceptions about empathy. Oh my gosh. There's so many. Um, (laughs) So I'll often, when I'm giving a keynote, I'll ask the audience to define empathy just to see kind of what's out there. And I typically get a variation of uh, three different answers. One is feeling the feelings of somebody else. Another one is seeing the point of view of somebody else. And then I'll also get the colloquial walk a mile in someone else's shoes as them. All of those things are correct, but that's part of what's so confusing. Um, There's different types of empathy. And I really focus on um, the emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. So emotional empathy, feeling the feelings of other people, cognitive empathy, perspective taking. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, a lot of people are uncomfortable around the topic of empathy itself because it's an E word like emotion. And (laughs) so they get afraid of it and they shouldn't, but they do. And, you know, as as many of us, and we may know people, if we're not this way ourselves, have difficulty accessing our emotions and getting down into that deeper place. So if we're not comfortable with our own emotions, how in the world are we going to connect to the feelings of somebody else? Okay. Yes. And, and, and there are people that are gifted at doing that. And, And let's put that aside. Let's talk about cognitive empathy understanding the point of view of somebody else. That's what we use in most of our day-to-day life. So whether you're interacting with the clerk at the store, a colleague, your boss, an employee, your family member, your neighbor, you're using cognitive empathy. You're trying to understand, hey, where are they coming from? What's their point of view on this? And then how do I use that information and understanding to relate back to them that I'm hearing them, but also using it to to make sure the communication is being received better. Maybe I'm using it to persuade them. Maybe I'm using it to collaborate or compromise. You're using empathy at all times you should be to get to a better place um, and a better outcome, more positive outcome. Um, But yeah, misconceptions of empathy, as you you asked, like, I love this one. Um, I have to give up my own point of view if I'm going to see the point of view of somebody else. Uh, Big, false, no, negative. You're making room in your head. It's just expands like expanding the pie. Um, There's other ways of moving through the world and that's okay. We want to be curious to try to understand where they're coming from, not just dismiss or, or think that we have to give up our own perspective. No, you can still feel the way that you do about something, but by being open and curious to something, another way of being, that's how you're going to solve um, whatever disconnect you have, problem, crisis, crisis right. challenge, I, I the the exercise and and audiences always love this. Like the volume level when I have different activities for people, the volume on this exercise is always the highest. And I, I boy, so this is part of step four: integrate into understanding, making room in your head that hey, there's other points of view. So I challenge people: like imagine you're going to go to an ice cream store with the person sitting next to you, and you only have one enough money for one shared scoop of ice cream, so a single flavor. Start by asking that person, "What's your favorite flavor of ice cream?" Typically, it's going to be different. From I don't know, Jill, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? I'll ask you right now. I mean, it depends on my mood, but I'm going to go pistachio. (laughs) <laughs> okay, pistachio. Um, I like pistachio, but I tend to go uh, with chocolate. We're actually enjoying a uh, Mexican chocolate right now from Mitchell's, which is a local San Francisco ice cream shop. Um, 
So I like Mexican chocolate. You like pistachio. Now we would want to be curious in the way this exercise plays out. You start asking each other questions. What do you like about that flavor? And, you know, some people like pistachio maybe because it's green or they like the crunch or the salt with the sweet, all of the things. Um, and then I've got reasons why I like that dark, soothing comfort of chocolate. And then the Mexican chocolate has a little bit of heat to it. We would continue that conversation until we found a flavor that we could compromise on. Hmm. That's what this is all about. We're trying to build empathy with each other, understanding where you're coming from, where I'm coming from. In this case, I actually do like pistachio. It's probably in my top five. So I'd probably be like, yeah, sure, whatever. It's a Thursday. Let's go get some pistachio. Um, but that's not always the case. And you you apply that approach to any topic, whether you're talking about, you know, the the big issues of the day, gun control, access to reproductive health, all of that, to, you know, disagreements that are happening at work um, and, and with other people. You want to get curious. You want to be open, make room to hear their perspective and where they're coming from, and then use that information to try to find a resolution. Mm. So I love that. So what I hear you saying also is that it doesn't make me wrong and you right or vice versa. It just means that I'm, you know, two ears, one mouth, use them proportionally, <laughs> listening <laughs> to what it is that you are saying and knowing, you know, in this case of the ice cream, obviously, if we're talking about, you know, major global issues or major U.S. issues, we have a common goal in the end is to move forward. It doesn't mean we have the same common goal. The common goal is we need to move forward and have progress for whatever that is. So trying to actually listen to the other person and finding that common ground. Right. And if you take any of those big issues and then the common issues or the low, you know, the ice cream issues, if you continue to explore and get down to its root cause, you're going to find some commonality. And it's from that point that you're then able to build and, and move forward. Amazing. Is there any other main ones that you would point out about misconceptions around empathy? Um, there, yeah, another one is, um, and there, there's a really, if you really want to go deeper on empathy, um, business solver has a, a study called state of workplace empathy that comes out every year. So it's a bit of a tracker, but some interesting data from last year was that, um, well, like 69%, I think of CEOs recognize that it's their responsibility to build an empathetic culture. Uh, 79% are uncomfortable being empathetic them, with their own empathy abilities. And 76% are afraid that they're going to lose respect if they are empathetic, if they show empathy. So they know they need it. They don't know how to do it. And they're afraid they're going to lose respect. Yes, exactly. And All right, we're fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then in the latest data, and I was just in the, one of my recent newsletters, I wrote about this. It's like the magical thinking of CEOs, because now what's actually happened in the uh, 2023 edition of that study, they found that CEOs are giving them like high watermark, like best ever scores for being empathetic, while the employees and the HR professionals in the survey are giving them the lowest marks ever in like the nine years or eight years of the study. So it's like, okay, I think CEOs are realizing they need to check the box of, yes, I'm empathetic and I'm comfortable with my empathy skills, oh. um, where the reality is very different in this world where we're laying people off by email and, you know. Or finding out because your key card doesn't work when you hit the lobby. Thank you. Yeah. Public, public shaming. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. Exactly. So when you think about, you know, empathy, right? To finding diversity of thought, diversity of people moving forward, having progress. That's, I would say, you know, the, the heart of what most of us think around empathy or, you know, loosely, we thought about it adjacent and that was kind of our understanding. But what, what you and I have talked about previously is like how to also use empathy on a job interview or how to persuade people with empathy. And I think especially in our current marketplace, we're still in a bubble. We're still at record levels of low unemployment with very high wages, but there's a bit of discomfort out there that people are starting to hear the layoffs with major companies and then other companies get nervous, right? So there's a bit of fear in that. Yeah. So as so many of our listeners are interviewing, so many of my private clients are interviewing also, 
how do you use empathy to persuade people and, and you know, get the promotion, get the job interview, get the, close the deal, close the sale. How do you use it for persuasion? Empathy. Yeah. Great question. Empathy is something that you use on a 360 basis. So it's with everybody that you're interacting with. So always keep that in mind when you're interviewing, let's say you want to be asking questions to get at understanding their point of view, where are they coming from? And it's not about, I, I believe that you need to be honest in your interviewing, but try to imagine, okay, you're them. It's not about what do they want to hear, but like, what are their real needs and how do your skills and experience actually match up to that? And how can you benefit them? So they themselves, you know, they themselves want to, you know, succeed, earn more money, get the promotion, you know, be the star, whatever that is. You, you're trying to pick up on what makes that person tick. Um, and some of that you can probably find out if you're doing a little, if you know who you're going to be meeting, if you're doing a little research ahead of time or understanding other experiences and interactions with the organization. But it's really that active listening. It's paying attention to what it is that they're needing and then thinking about how do my skills fit what they need and presenting yourself in that way, still honestly, but from that lens of, hey, I know you need this and here's where my relevant experience is. Yeah, no, I, that is, I hadn't thought of it that way for the lens of empathy. Um, so a really, really good way of summarizing it. What I often tell people that I work with is that your resume is not about you. Your LinkedIn profile is not about you. It's about them. The only yeah. challenge, we don't know who the them is <laughs> until we meet them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, I mean, you're you're saying the same thing. It's like, we're still being honest. We're keeping our integrity intact. We're staying professional. We're not lying. But if you understand what the particular challenges of the hiring manager, the person you're interviewing with, you may want to craft your career narrative or the stories you're telling them to answer and solve their challenges versus just telling me a laundry list over what you've done previously. Right, exactly. It's about how you can solve their need the problem that they have versus, oh, here's just the my compliments. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And then does that differ? Do you think if you're, you know, working in sales or business development and trying to close the deal? It's all good sales, good business development. If you ask a successful professional, they'll tell you it is about the relationship. And relationships are about empathy building. It's about trying to understand what somebody's needs are. So it, it, it's very similar. It's taking the time to ask the questions. And then I love the two ears, one mouth, use them proportionately to listen <laughs> and to listen to what people are saying and what they're telling you and what those needs are and keep asking questions. You know, it, it, it's kind of the, one of the most in, influential books I ever read was Dale Carnegie and how to win friends and influence people. And one of the things he said is people like to talk about themselves. So just ask them questions and then listen, listen. Yeah. and hear, and what are you picking up? And I talk about active listening as well. So that's step three in the five steps. So you want to make sure that you are present um, obviously if it's an interview, you're, you know, you, you have no choice. You can't be on your phone or your laptop, or, or maybe you're doing a zoom interview, but you need to be really focused on that person and, and be present, be paying attention. Don't worry about the laundry list of other things that you've got to do. Be in that moment and trust your intuition. And I write about that in the book. Um, there's a chapter called the ghosts in the room where I went into an interview with somebody to talk about soup but I could sense there was other stuff going on with that individual and there was almost like an energy in the room. And so it, as he kind of introduced what that might be, I grabbed that thread and I pulled on it and we ended up talking for 45 minutes about a nephew that had just passed. It was in his early twenties wow. and how devastated he was by that loss and the journey that that grief was taking him on. But we needed to do that in order to get to, talking about soup ultimately right, right. Um, that path but really powerful um example of just like trusting your intuition like in that voice in your head is telling you there's something else here like listen to it and and start to trust that 
voice and and ask the follow-up question. So active listening is using all your senses. It's not just your ears. Mm -hmm. It's the things that you're, you know, smelling um, in some cases, witnessing with your eyes. Um, You know, when somebody, you know, I've got three cats as we've talked about, and they like to show up at different (laughs) times. And that was part of what led to like the great resignation was this lack of empathy from managers to employees during the pandemic. And like, if I'm sorry, if you've got a kid doing cartwheels behind you on a Zoom call, you're going to be distracted. And so <laughs> listen to that, pay attention to that if you're the, on the other end of that call or that conversation. And you know, ask a question, oh, hey, do you need to go take care of that? Or I'm getting a feeling, you know, and some language to use in that sales persuasion situation is I'm getting the sense that, or I feel, or what I'm hearing is, can you, you know, help me understand, is this true? And you're you're replaying, you're repeating what you're either sensing or you're hearing to make sure that you're getting it right. The other person's going to appreciate that because they're going to have the chance to correct you. Mm-hmm. They're going to have the chance to affirm mm-hmm. and they're going to feel heard that, okay, this person is listening to me. It's making me think um, around networking. So many people are like, oh, I hate networking or I hate going to networking events, um, but they need to either to maintain their presence and their presence and relevancy, or perhaps they're looking for a job. How do you see them, you know, you've mentioned two already of the five skills, you've got active listening, integrative um, understanding. How would you pivot that and use it within a networking situation? Again, people want to talk about themselves. Um, So be curious and ask questions. And, And the first step is dismantling judgment. So you want to get that down. Don't and, and it's not about making a judgment. Do I walk down a dark alley? It's about being judgmental. So don't avoid somebody because you don't find them physically attractive or you don't like the choice of outfit that they made. Be open to that. They're, they're still a person. They're a human. Ask them questions like, you know, just, how are you today? Um, and then the second step is asking good questions. So oftentimes we default to asking questions that are going to affirm our worldview. And instead you want to ask open questions that are exploratory. Mm -hmm. So don't ask somebody um, how they feel about working in the office again. Um, Which is a loaded question. Which is such a loaded question where you could ask, you know, so if you're a manager, for example, you're wanting to talk to your team about where they're working, like, don't ask them like, hey, what do you think about, you know, being in the office again? Ask them instead, what's your sense, what's your feeling about the different spaces in which you are working? So it can be about the office, it can be about home, it can be about the cafe that they go to, wherever they're they're working. You're going to get a much more honest sort of answer from that person. So you want to be curious. And by being curious, you will be interesting to other people. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it, this is not what that Maya Angelou quote, right? We don't remember what you say. We remember what you may, how you made me feel. And that's yeah. when you're trying to network, um, especially if you do a job, right? You want to yeah. make people feel good in your presence. I love that. Exactly. Okay, so yeah. We talked about four, the last yes. step. Last one is use solution imagination. This is where you've been, you know, you've dismantled your judgment. You're asking the questions. You're listening. You're integrating. You're making room in your head. Okay, she likes pistachio. What am I going to do with that? Um, and that then you solution imagination is where you start to turn it around and you start to imagine. So that that's where empathy starts to go into practice, and you're using that to further that conversation. So. What are the things that you might be picking up on and how does that inform? Um, one of um, one of the stories, I'm like, I was going to say one of my favorite stories in the book. <laughs> they're, they they're, actually, yeah, they're all I'm your like, favorite They are all my children. They're all beautiful. Um, no, but, but one of the stories that I always come back to, um, there's a chapter called What Are You Willing to Sacrifice? And it's in the Use Solution Imagination section. We were up in Canada. We were talking to people that were recent immigrants within the last five or seven years to understand how they acculturated and what that journey looked like. And it was a food client, so it was specific to food. But you start broad and understand life. 
And what was it like? You landed at Toronto Pearson Airport and then what happened? Um, and there was one uh, couple we were talking to, they were from India and the husband was a civil engineer over in India. The wife was a school teacher. None of their education transferred or their credentials. So he was actually pushing a broom on the factory floor. She got a job at Burger King working the grill line. Okay, she was working fast food. Until you start to realize, and I'm connecting dots, she had told us earlier that she's Hindi. I was going to, that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah. And okay. So the cow is a sacred symbol in the Hindu religion. So I used my solution imagination. I was started to put myself like, oh my God, what was that like? And so I used, so that's using solution imagination. I'm using that like, oh my gosh, was that difficult for her? And so I asked her. And I'll let people read the chapter to find out what she said, but it was really emotional and powerful because it was yeah. the sacrifice that she was having to make in order to create a better life for her son and for her family. And um, yeah, that's using solution imagination. So I was hearing things, I was connecting the dots, and I was using that to formulate the next question that I was going to ask mm -hmm. in that case. So it's really staying present. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're doing you're doing all those five steps. It, it, it's not like hmm, I'm in step one and now I'm moving to step two. <laughs> you're using them all all at once. And depending on the situation, the context, who you're talking to, like judgment is the one that gets in most people's way. Um, but sometimes you just can't ask the right question or you're just not listening because you're distracted by something else that has happened. So you've got to be aware of the steps and practice the steps. And then ultimately, and I talk about there's four uh, bigger actions that you need to take. So one is just the self-awareness of all this going on. Two is the courage. I always quote Maya Angelou around that. You've got to have the courage to do this. Mm -hmm. Three is to practice the five steps. The fourth one, though, is to have grace mm -hmm. because we're all human. And we're this is about progress and not perfection. Mm -hmm. I. I ask people in my speeches to, on a scale of one to five, one low, five high, where would you rate your empathy skills? And while they're formulating that answer, and I don't have them share, I do that on a survey, but not in public because it's private. But I'll tell them, I'm like, I'm an empathy activist. And on a good day, I'm a four. Most days, I'm a 3.5 because my family was born brown-eyed and judgy, and it just comes out. And I've got to be aware of it and work on it. <laughs> It's amazing. Amazing. Um, I have a few more questions that I would love to ask you. And then I want to hear about what we can look for next from you. Yes. Um, how do you tap into your own gut? Ooh, I love that question. Um, you know, some, a concept I've started talking about a lot in the last six months or so is this idea of taking a curious breath. Mm. And a curious breath, you know, the, the neuroscientists will tell you when you have stimulus presented to you, somebody asks something, says something, and then you respond. There's a little tiny space in between. Those two things don't perfectly match up. It's in that little space that you need to get in there and take a curious breath. So when you somebody's coming at you or, you know, you're having a conversation, just take a breath, take a curious breath, it gives you the chance to kind of turn things around. And as it relates to intuition, that's when you have that opportunity to kind of maybe hear it, hear the mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. um, my intuition, I've always been curious about where intuition shows up for people because I find it shows up in different parts of their body. I sometimes hear a voice in my head. Mm -hmm. And then I also sometimes get a feeling in my heart center. Mm. And so when I'm getting that, I, I'm paying attention to it mm -hmm. and I listen to it. And it's just this like intuitive flash mm -hmm. of thought that comes in and you have to have some self-awareness like, oh, wait, what's going on? Right. Um, and then listen to it and take it in. And mm -hmm. I have never found my intuition to lead me wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's going to be helpful for a lot of people to touch in, especially you mentioning that you may get it from different sources. It may be your own voice. It could be your grandmother's voice. It could be, you know, it could be yeah. some sensation in your body. So I think that's really important. All right. My last question for you is what was one thing that you um, like 
or you liked more than you thought you would, that you were like, I don't want to do this. And you were like, hey, that wasn't so bad. I actually really like that. Uh, related to, to career, to career, to my career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, hmm. I can tell you the thing that I really hated and then that'll okay, we'll go there. You that. I can figure out what I like. One of my very first jobs before I got an office job working in college, because again, I could type, I got a job. We, My parents moved from Indiana to Virginia outside of DC. So I had no contacts or connections. I got a job going door to door for clean water action, cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay and your drinking water, soliciting donations. Wow. Oh my God, that was painful. Yeah. Painful. Hated it. Doors slammed in your face. Hot, muggy, mid Atlantic summer weather. I lasted a day. And I was just like, I'm done. I can't. No, this is no, not me. I am an office person. I need to have. <laughs> I need air conditioning. I do. I do. Clean drinking water. There's a reason why I live in San Francisco. It's temperate. <laughs> oh my God. You know, um, saying that my first job, which I thought I was going to hate, but kind of around this conversation that I ended up liking because of the empathy factor was I booked funerals. I worked within a funeral and a, um, it was connected to a church. It was the funeral home and the intake for everything. And at first I was like, <gasps> you know, that's going to be horrible. And, and at times it was horrible, but being there and holding space and oh. helping the family and the loved ones reflect on whatever they needed to reflect on and then creating a place for them to honor the yeah. um, loved one. Um, again, I was like, I'm never going to last. And I did it for like five years. That's it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, when you were we were ta started by talking about my journey and uh, the way I always think about it, like we are all at this going to the same destination, which is death, mm -hmm. and then the transition into whatever that next journey is. Um, we're all going to be there, so it's about those adventures in that moment. But it, I'm I've been so fascinated, having had a lot of loss in my own life the last five years or so, and our discomfort in our society about talking about grief and death and loss. And yet we all go through it, all go through it. And, and it is about honoring and, and, you know, feeling all of the different emotions and knowing like it's okay. And so back to empathy, showing up for other people and recognizing when somebody might be suffering and, you know, feel their pain or see it and cognitively connect to it and just say like, Hey, how, how are you today? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This has been such a treat, Rob. Tell everyone, I'm going to put all of your information in the show notes, where they can find your book, where they can follow you on the socials. What is next for you? Is there a second book? Is there, there speak, more speaking? Tell us. Yeah. So more, definitely more speaking. That's in the, the near term. I do keynotes and some light training sessions for all the different offsites and whatever needs are. So if there's any listener that's interested, please reach out. Um, I am working on, or, or th I'm thinking about, I'm ruminating on the second book, which is going to be more around empathy as well. Um, and a lot of examples about what's not empathy, because I think we see that and it's important for people to recognize when somebody's being empathetic and when they're not. Yes. I love that. I love that. Well, again, thank you for spending this time. There's a lot of gems throughout this entire conversation that I know people are going to be listening and making notes listening as they're listening. So thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with our listeners. Thank you. I look forward to connecting with them on the socials and helping them on their journey. Thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one -on -one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon.